Hello and welcome to the first lesson of period two. Today we're going to be contextualizing period two. So your learning objective is to explain the context for the colonization of North America from 1607 to 1754. And I wanna say that I'm going to be tightly focused here on the APUSH curriculum. So while we're going to be talking about the world, we're gonna be talking about large people groups, I'm going to really narrowly focus here on what applies to the AP curriculum. With that being said, I am also not going to address everything that could apply, but rather give you some parameters of what would work for contextualization. So we're gonna start with a definition here, what it is. We're gonna talk about what the societies were like before 1607, so prior to the start of this unit, and then we're going to end with transatlantic exchanges. So a review of contextualization is that it is to, uh, students will need to analyze the context of historical events, developments, or processes. And you do that by identifying and describing historical context or explaining how a specific historical development is situated within broader context. So what does that mean in language that is actually understandable? Well, it means that in this class, you're going to uh, come across maybe a, a small focus um, a small topic or a small time period. And what you wanna do is you want to broaden it. So this often, often happens in essays. It often happens in your introduction paragraph where you're gonna be describing what is happening around the time period of the prompt or what is happening before the prompt. A lot of times teachers use this uh, to describe it um, with like a set of dominoes that the prompt might be starting with uh, the second or the third domino. And so for contextualization, you wanna talk about what's happening before that that's going to knock down that domino. Another way of describing it is like the funnel. So how are things getting smaller and smaller down to your prompt? So when we're talking about um, a unit, what, what is happening in the time period? What is happening before the time period that influences the events of the time period? So what we really are going to talk about here is some generalities about the European societies before 1607. So this is kind of a bit of a review of period one. So what we see here is that in North America and South America, the English, I'm sorry, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the French have already started their settlements. They have started their colonization efforts. They are the three groups that are uh, European groups that are most primarily engaged in the conquest of the Americas. Um, wealth will be generated in a variety of ways, most likely or most frequently in the Spanish Empire through precious metals and agriculture, and more common in the French Empire with uh, furs and fish. So the English and Dutch are going to begin their colonization closer to the 1600s. And so um, we're not going to see them as prominent in the first exploratory efforts. Now, there is some changes that happen as well from the 1500s to the 1600s. In the 1500s, while there were permanent settlements, there was a lot more temporary explorers that were coming and going. And by the 1600s, we see more permanent settlements occurring. So why did the English settlement begin later? Since this class is a U.S. history class, we're going to focus in on the English. Well, one reason is going to be the Protestant Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation is kind of that split within the, the Christian church. And so then there's the Catholic church and there is the um, Protestant church. And the Protestant church then is going to subdivide into lots and lots of groups like um, the Puritans and uh, the Baptists and the Quakers. So there's going to be a whole bunch of different groups that separate within Protestantism. But what happens here is that the English are going to formally become Protestant, whereas countries like Spain are going to remain Catholic. And so when Spain is colonizing in the New World and generating all this wealth for the Spanish Empire and converting American Indians to Catholicism, it appears as though they are more... Um, that the religion is more prevalent or better. And so in 1588, when the English actually defeat the Spanish Armada, that's their navy, it begins to show a difference that the English and, the, and Protestantism may actually be more important. And so that is going to fuel patriotism in the country and it's going to fuel um, endeavors to continue to prove that through North American 
colonization efforts. In 1603, another big change happens. James I replaces Queen Elizabeth, and Queen Elizabeth had um, engaged in royally supported piracy. So what would happen is she would help um, or allow for piracy to occur. So English, uh, like Sir Francis Drake, would um, act as a pirate against the Spanish ships. And whatever he would bring back, I believe it was um, a tenth or maybe 20% of what he took would then go to the, uh, to the English crown. That was incredibly, well, uh, it produced a ton of wealth for the English empire. It was going very well. But James I is actually going to decide he wants to have a, a better relationship with the Spanish. And so he ends that piracy or tries to end it um, and instead emphasizes actual settlements and allows for the creation of the Virginia Company, which is a joint stock company. You can check out that term. Uh, in my VIT playlist, my very important term playlist, if you need a little bit more information. But basically, it allows for instead of just one person to try to um, pay for and take all the risk of a of a North American settlement, it allows for a group of investors, a joint group to invest together, share the risk, share the profit. And that just hadn't happened before. So that allows for um, this company, the Virginia Company, to actually put forward the um, voyage to settle in Jamestown. Okay, so then what comes is a big comparison. This is what uh, topic 2.2 is all about, and I have a whole video where I go through all of these details. But basically, what I just talked about was those pre-European societies um, before 1607. That is then what leads to the the comparison of the colonization. This is a really key point that you need to know for period two. And so um, understanding what was happening before then helps you to understand what you need to know to compare them. All right, so American Indians on the Atlantic seaboard. As you can see by that map that there are many different groups that are living in the area um, or in this region that the English eventually settle in. And so kind of a review again of period one is that you should be familiar with the fact that these groups lived diverse lives and their environment often had the largest impact on why the lives differed um, or why society differed from one area versus another. Okay, so. European explorations began shortly, European explorations into North America began shortly after Columbus's first voyage. And oftentimes they brought with them animals and those animals were often carriers of diseases. And when those animals would get loose from the, you know, from where they had landed, they would continue, they would actually spread the diseases into the interior. And so often diseases actually um, affected groups before Europeans had even gotten there. Um, and that happened in some cases. So um, additionally, something that is often unknown is that some American Indians actually traveled back to Europe. And so they um, would then uh, sometimes come back to the Americas as translators and would be able to be a kind of a go between between different groups. So all this to say is that there are diverse expectations and reactions to Europeans. In some areas, they're more welcoming. In some areas, they're more resistant. And um, that is really important for understanding how our 13 colonies end up differing is because the groups that they interact with impact how, um, how much conflict they will face in the area. Okay, and then finally, another understanding of Africans prior to 1607. Um, by 1607, the West, the West Coast of Africa has very strong trade networks with the Portuguese, Dutch, and English. And what we see happening for sure by 1600 is that there has been a shift in the slave trade. Prior to this, um, females were more likely to be enslaved and they were more likely to be traded to the Middle East. But now, as of 16, as the 1600s develop, more males are going to be enslaved and they're going to be sent to the Americas. So we see a big shift in the African slave trade. The first transatlantic voyage does begin in 1526, although the first um, Africans to be purchased in um, the English colonies won't happen until 1619. What happens in Africa, though, as a result of this is that the European demand for enslaved persons fueled warfare. And so there was a slave trade happening before this European demand. But now that the Europeans demanded so many persons um, and were trading goods like weapons, um, 
American Indian tribes, I'm sorry, not American Indian tribes, Africans were then going to war in order to get people um, to sell and to put into captivity versus prior to this, um, warfare would have already been existing and people would have been taken in as captives as, as a result. But now they're going to have more warfare in order to get captives. Up uh, in that picture there is Almina Castle in Ghana. And that arch that you see there um, is uh, something called like the, the door of no return. And so that was often the last passage out of Africa that many enslaved, enslaved persons would have seen. Okay, so wrapping up here, transatlantic exchanges. This is also a key kind of broad idea of what is happening in the time period. So there's commercial, religious, philosophical, and political exchanges that are happening across the Atlantic. And here are just four of the main ones that you should be familiar with. So mercantilism is this economic policy where a country is going to um, seek to increase their exports and decrease their imports. And so colonies were a huge part of that because for example, England, much of their land was settled and they had a real lack of raw materials. So they're able to then gain raw materials from um, North America. And that's not considered an import because they're part of the British Empire. So it's a way to increase the amount of materials that they are able to then import to others. Triangular trade is another key term for this uh, unit, understanding the pattern of commerce. So thinking about how um, primarily raw materials are going to Europe and manufactured goods are being sold to Africa, and then um, people are then being sold to the Americas. And so it's a pattern of commerce between the three continents. The Enlightenment is an intellectual movement, and this is going to um, really move people towards some new political understandings, the ideas of self-government, the ideas of natural rights and John Locke. And then finally, the idea of Anglo Anglicization. And this is how a group or region becomes more like England. And so that's really the process happening in period two, right? North America had little to no interactions with Europe. And now as the 13 colonies settled, they bring those English cultures with them over to this region. So all of this is like kind of the big broad understandings that are necessary to compare the four colonial regions. And this is going to be the big, big target that you have in a period two is to be able to know these four colonial regions, how they were similar, how they were different and why that occurred. Um, so that would kind of be your narrow focus. And then on a big essay prompt or something, you may bring in one of these ideas that I've just discussed to contextualize period two. So all going back to that learning objective, explain the context for the colonization of North America from 1607 to 1754. So I hope that video was really helpful for you. And if so, um, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed.